All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Um, today is obviously a very special day. I'm so happy that you guys are here in person. Um, I think we have a great Zoom audience as well. Um, this is a very special grand rounds as uh, this is the last grand rounds of our academic year. And then uh, the last grand rounds with Dr. Vale as our chair. So we have the honor of having Dr. Vale as our grand round speaker today. Um, and I have the very challenging task of introducing him for uh, this occasion. Um, this is also going to be, a, I think, a fun setup today. Um, as some of you know, Dr. Pandya, Dr. Feely, and myself, um, since COVID, have hosted a podcast on uh, sports medicine, orthopedic surgery. Uh, Dr. Vale came with the idea of um, having more of a discussion rather than just a talk, um, having some more engagement. So uh, we'll have a brief talk from him, followed by some um, interactive portion, questions from the audience. Um, and then we'll be broadcasting it live as a podcast along with our Zoom audience and uh, will be recorded as well. Um, so uh, for an introduction, so Dr. Vale is uh, the Michael and Antoinette Pappas um, Endowed Chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery here at UCSF. Um, he has been the chair of our department um, since 2007. Uh, so Dr. Vale um, originally grew up in Western Springs, Illinois, uh, with his parents, Jean and Tom, um, and they're now in North Carolina. Uh, grew up with his brother, uh, Rob, who's in Charlotte, and Sally, who's in Wisconsin. Um, he attended um, West or Lyons Township High School. Uh, he um, excelled there. He, I think as no surprise, was uh, the president of his junior and seniors classes. Uh, he played soccer. Uh, he was also a gymnast uh, and a participant in the circus club, which I think was the most surprising <laughs> thing that I found. <laughs> um, but it, it obviously surprising. someone of multiple talents. Um, he then um, attended Duke for undergraduate where he majored in mechanical engineering. Um, he um, continued a path of excellence there and then went to Loyola for medical school. Uh, while at Loyola, he met uh, Lisa, um, now his wife. Um, and then uh, Dr. Vail then returned to Duke for his orthopedic surgery residency training and fellowship. Uh, Lisa followed him one year after Dr. Vail started and they were married uh, during her intern year, his second year. Um, while in North Carolina, they had their two children, Brennan and Parker. Um, he then finished fellowship and transitioned to an academic practice at Duke. Uh, he became the uh, chief of their arthroplasty service and had a very uh, productive uh, academic and clinical career at Duke. Um, and then that sought UCSF to recruit him into the uh, chair position of our department in 2007. Uh, when he took over our department, uh, we were a faculty of about 20. Uh, we've grown since to be uh, of over 100 at this point. Uh, we had uh, most of our clinical practices focused at Parnassus at that point. Um, under his leadership and guidance, uh, we opened the Orthopedic Institute, which has served as um, kind of our flagship clinical location. We've expanded clinical practices uh, throughout the Bay Area to allow for improved access of care for our patients. Uh, the research uh, infrastructure and productivity, uh, the global outreach, uh, the, the emphasis on diversity and inclusion, um, educational um, initiatives have all flourished under Dr. Vale's leadership. Um, Dr. Vale has also been an active researcher himself uh, with um, publications ranging from clinical outcomes uh, to basic science to leadership uh, and essentially everything in between. Um, at UCSF, uh, he has served as a leader on the Finance Committee. Um, he has directed uh, the Funds Flow uh, Committee. Um, and then nationally, he has served a number of organizations. He's the past president of uh, the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, um, the Knee Society, uh, the Eastern Orthopedic Association. Uh, he's also past president of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons um, and has really left his mark on a number of different areas. Um, I think for many of us in the room, uh, Dr. Vale has... Um, really impacted uh, our careers and our trajectories. Um, his steady guidance, uh, I think, has allowed us to navigate through many challenges most recently, you know, um, keeping going and, um, you know, rejuvenating after COVID. Um, I think his uh, mentorship has uh, sparked, I think, my career. I think uh, I look out and so many others um, who have, you know, known you as our, our chair for our time at uh, UCSF. And um, I think through research projects, uh, educational programs, international work, um, and really just that development of a fantastic group of people. Um, your mark here is uh, strong and um, really quite impressive. Um, so Dr. Vale, um, thank you uh, for uh, doing this today, um, for um, you speaking at our last grand rounds of the year, uh, but mostly thank you for all you've done for um, our department, um, for UCSF, and uh, really for orthopedic surgery. Um, you're, um, impact is impressive, and um, look forward to your comments today. Thank you. Thank you.
very nice. Thank you. Okay. Wow, it's nice to see everybody in the audience. The, the day has come. Uh, and Drew asked me to, if I would do a, a Grand Rounds at the beginning of last year in planning. I was thinking, oh, gosh. They're going to want to hear from me again. Um, so thank you for indulging me now, and uh, re I will we'll return my thanks to you. And uh, underline some things that you've, you've probably heard from me, uh, some messages that I'd like to leave with you as we, as we look ahead in addition to looking back a little bit. You know, I get the question, what are you going to do next? And it occurs to me that, um, you know, that's probably kind of hidden in my conflict. So we, we go quickly by the conflicts often. And I, I thought I'd pose here for a moment just to say um, some of these conflicts, uh, Cytex is uh, Farsh Gilak's company. This is this uh, woven collagen thing with seeding that he's trying to replace articular surfaces. I'm on the scientific advisory board for that. Uh, Hylex is a, uh, a company that um, has a, a polymer that acts like cartilage. I'll be uh, helping them. I'm on their scientific board. And I'll be continuing there. And Tessa Medical, something that came out of the UCSF Innovation Hub that I, I helped start. It's a, a tensiometer. And I'll continue on the board of trustees. So the conflicts aren't just things that you hide. They're things that you're interested in and will continue with. Um, OK. So let me back up. No. All right, it's working now. So, thank you. It's an honor to be in front of you today. I want to tell you a, a brief story, and I'll keep it brief, before we repair to the living room with Dr. Feely and Dr. Lansdowne. And this story is really about a journey. How did it get started? Uh, where is it headed? And I'll tell you one thing. This goes by uh, very quickly. Here's 30 years in one slide. And I tried to Photoshop this, but by the time I got my face looking like it used to be, Marcus was so skinny, I knew that I'd be, uh, I'd be, I'd be busted. It wouldn't, wouldn't work. You wouldn't believe it. But so that's, uh, that's reality. Uh, with uh, me, with Leonard Goldner and Charlie Ng back in 1993 when I was uh, starting in my practice. And it's amazing how quickly um, it's gone by. <clears throat> and early <clears throat> in your career, you begin to learn about leadership. You're, you're placed in leadership roles, observe uh, systems that work very well. As you heard, I happen to be at Duke. I happen to be around this basketball program. I got to know this basketball coach. And I'm not really big on sports analogies, but um, one thing that I learned early on <clears throat> came from Mike Krzyzewski and that simple notion that success includes change. And what you've done in the past to be successful isn't necessarily what you need to do in the future. And that's a fundamental foundational uh, message uh, for all of us. So why did I seek change? I was comfortable uh, you know, where I was in North Carolina. And this, hopefully, these comments are relevant to, uh, to some of you in various stages of your career. And the, the change in going from one institution to another was really not about having a job as a chair or a title. It was more about an opportunity to be creative and to contribute in some way. And UCSF was a place that I perceived I could do that. And Fundamental to that was building an institute that would serve patients' needs, grow a clinical program, develop a research program, and to face new challenges, to uh, test myself. Uh, that's, that's what you're looking, I think, looking for uh, in a job, not a place where you sit and transfer information from one person to the next. The places are very different. <clears throat> On top, this is the leafy green Durham, North Carolina, with the clock tower quad in the back. Some of you may recognize Jesse Helms, who was my senator, very conservative senator, moved to this place, San Francisco. My representative is Nancy Pelosi, could not be more different. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis now in how different we are and uh, how we can't get along. But I'll tell you <clears throat> that the institutions are very similar. The people are very similar. The mission is very similar. So my message here is that we're really more alike than we are different. 
even though sometimes the differences are very stark. <clears throat> so what about becoming a chair? I was told, and I now believe it, <laughs> that, that it would be hard work. In fact, it would be one of the hardest things that I would do in my career. And for a while, even after I got here, I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> I, uh, I would have dreams that I was somewhere else. That I wasn't in San, wake up and I'm in San Francisco and the day is coming at you. <clears throat> so you gradually realize that things have fundamentally changed and you jump into it. Um, when I uh, started, it wasn't about a health system. And the biggest concern for the chairs was uh, the contract with Brown and Tolan, you know, negotiating rates. We weren't talking about having uh, clinics all over the Bay Area. And these were some of the themes that we, that we had to deal with. Obviously me, this is Mark Larratt, the CEO before Suresh, the person who was really instrumental in the person I negotiated with when I came here about the Orthopedic Institute. But we had these set of priorities in our department, personalized, getting work done, the highest quality, moving into the outpatient arena with more of what we did, and dealing with this burden of documentation. These are themes that are still around. They were forefront um, when I got started. And this, the CEO of the health system kind of has a different perspective. And so you have to figure out what's your common ground? How do you move forward, create alignment? And, and part of that was in uh, how we delivered musculoskeletal care that turned out to be uh, great. Um, and I will also say that our team responded magnificently over time to these challenges, what was in front of us. And I want to single out Brenda, Richard, and Debbie, uh, who are here today, have been my partners since the, virtually the beginning. Richard, definitely the beginning. Debbie and Brenda, almost the beginning. Thank you guys for, for, for being there through this whole journey. And this is directed to uh, everyone in the audience, many sources of pride. So here we are in 2009, and if you look on the picture, there are some faces of people who are uh, no longer with us, Freddie Fu, J.O.J., and there are also uh, some people who were here uh, from the beginning and have been instrumental uh, in the success of this department. So the people here are very important and very unique, and it's worth taking a moment to recognize. This is a place where people want to make a difference. It's not just about themselves in the community and in the world. And really, there are not many programs that can match that sort of legacy and perspective. And here we are in 2023. First of all, we're in better focus. <laughs> Even hey, cameras have gotten better. Um, and we're bigger. We're more diverse. We're more specialized. Um, and uh, incredibly talented. So the people uh, have made it uh, a wonderful uh, journey for me. And that includes the staff. Um, this is just from a recent uh, staff you know, recognition uh, event that, that Debbie would organize every quarter. And we gather on the second floor, and we, we recognize an individual staff member. And if you look at these faces, there are some people here that have been uh, in the Orthopedic Institute since it opened its doors. And they're dedicated, they're talented, and they're committed to what we're doing. So creating a team and uh, having that sort of commitment uh, from the staff has also been key to our success. And again, another fundamental underlying theme is creating highly effective teams. Um, I have been honored every year to be asked to sit in this picture. Uh, and I always do it a little bit uncomfortably. Do I belong here? Should I, should I be doing this? Um, and uh, it's not just a, a picture. It's something that also deserves underlining. And it's uh, one, another definition of our program. <clears throat> and it goes back long before that picture was taken. UCSF has produced pioneering women in surgery really at a time before that was appreciated. And you can argue it's not appreciated enough now, but even less so previously. <clears throat> As a resident, I was first exposed to the 
work of Jacqueline Perry. And if any of you haven't looked at what she did in gate mechanics, her book, I would encourage you to do that, only later to learn that she's a UCSF graduate. And as I reflect on this, I really didn't understand <clears throat> the challenges that women faced when I was a resident and a young attending. <clears throat> and we're gradually improving and understanding that better, making the future much more exciting, both for women and people of underrepresented backgrounds entering orthopedic surgery. And this is a source of great pride. And it's derived partly from my personal perspective from respect for my wife, who is here, uh, my mother, who was a, a pioneering woman, one of the first Episcopal priests in the United States, uh, my sister, uh, who's an incredible single mom, and my daughter, who is a neonatology fellow here at UCSF. The Orthopedic Institute um, was the cornerstone of what I wanted to accomplish when I came here. And it was part of the negotiating that I did with Mark Larratt. And he, he agreed to uh, indulge and uh, allow us to pursue uh, this vision. And it has been fundamental uh, to our success, not only our ability to deliver care, but our ability to fund the mission. Because it is a, a joint uh, effort between the department and the health system. And that's in 2009 when it was just being built. And it's come a long way in a short period of time. And I would say that the Orthopedic Institute was really the department's first moonshot. Thinking big, thinking to the future, audacious goals. And so we planned it carefully. We had a vision. We empowered talented people that are sitting in this room to do things. And results followed. And it's been wonderful. And it's not the only moonshot at UCSF. I would put a number of other things in that category including IGOT and the international work that's going on here. More recently, it's just beginning to uh, bear fruit, is the Mount Zion expansion, the research explosion, and I'll touch on the importance of that before I finish, and the transformation of our ambulatory practice around the Bay Area. Incredible accomplishments. As Drew alluded to, we also got through this, and a huge challenge. And uh, this is Charlie, uh, my grandson, who was born in March of 2000, and we'll come back to Charlie in a little while. Um, and we're, we've gotten to here, uh, reinventing ourselves, and, uh, and that's, um, that's been a, a productive uh, exercise. So if there's anything that good that came out of this, it's the notion that we could and we needed to uh, reinvent ourselves. And what we learned from this experience, I think, is that change happens. You, you've got to figure out how to adapt and embrace, and I'll, I'll touch more on that theme. But some of it's predictable, some of it's progressive, some of it seems random, uh, and sometimes change just convulses things that we count on, like the pandemic and like reform movements uh, and sometimes advances in technology. So we evolve, and it's a little digression here. Um, I had a chance to hear a lecture about evolution, and I'll, I'll come to that next. And the point that I wanted to make to you, it's just kind of cutting to the chase, is that evolution is a balance between origination and extinction, OK? Not, I'm not extinct, but I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> and there's origination uh, in the audience, and we focus on the extinction part. So when we lose something like this, you know, we lament, and we should. Uh, but what people don't realize is that because if we have this diverse ecosystem around the world, that even in the last year, 17,000 new species have been discovered. And that's kind of our future. What do we learn from that? How do we evolve? And then what do we learn from what we've lost as well? So uh, Kevin Padian is the person who delivered this lecture. He's a paleontologist at Berkeley. Maybe some of you have taken his class. I don't know. He wrote a book about how birds evolved from dinosaurs. So he's really credible. Uh, and um, I, I thought that his uh, views on evolution were relevant to how we think about ourselves. And he said that in nature, 
We don't have an extinction crisis. We have a diversity crisis. Because if we destroy habitat, we destroy diversity, we destroy our opportunities to understand the new things in our environment that can lead us forward. That has some resonance, uh, doesn't it? So for us, musculoskeletal research and innovation could be considered the engine of origination, our intellectual and professional habitat, uh, if you will, that must be preserved and expanded. And that's my pitch for uh, continuing to support, expand, and promote the innovation and research in our department. And just a little editorializing, I, I think that musculoskeletal science is not fully understood. Um, Tamara, Alliston, and Jeff, and, and Rich, and others have, have all discussed this. It's maybe oversimplified. We've had to really work to find our place, and, and it's come a long way. Um, the recognition of the importance of uh, the science around the musculoskeletal system. But if it were properly understood, the mechanical mechanosensor in the body, reservoir of uh, critical minerals, elements, the regenerative capacity that we're starting to see in labs like um, Brian Feely's and, and, and others at uh, uh, looking at fracture healing at, at San Francisco General, driver of humor and endocrine systems, the crosstalk that occurs. Um, the link to other organ systems and disease processes is if that was recognized better, we would get more attention, we would get more funding, and it's, it's the truth, it's real, and we've got to keep uh, beating that drum. And I think uh, for those of us in the, in the clinical realm doing surgery, thinking that we're, we're pretty good at what we do and the operations that we do are pretty good, it's true, but all problems are not solved. And I would argue that even the best solutions that we have to offer patients can be improved, and we should all, all be thinking about why. Next, what's going on at UCSF that we have to prepare for? It's no secret. Here's the strategic plan. Here's what's in it. Remote monitoring, virtual visits, biometric, genomics, pharmaceuticals, etc. It doesn't say musculoskeletal health on this picture. Not that it's excluded, but we need to find our place in the future of what will be emphasized going forward. And, uh, and there are many ways that we belong in this picture. We have to understand it and know where it's headed. So I'll finish with some final thoughts. What really matters? Well, this really matters. That's Charlie three years later. We're reinventing ourselves. We're out of the pandemic. Life goes on. The future is bright. And David has come along since. These are both my daughter Brennan's children. And I think what these experiences illustrate is echoed in the words of Paul Coelho. Some of you may have read The Alchemist. I, I thought it was a great book, uh, beautifully written. Um, not everybody loves it, but there's a lot of truth in it about life. And one of those is that the secret of life is to fall seven times, is to get up eight times. And I think many of you have heard a rendition of this philosophy. It's about resilience. And these challenges require resilience. What we do is difficult. It's hard. And it requires getting up the eighth time. It also requires a culture of leadership. And this is something that we've tried to emphasize in our department encouraging people to, to read and understand, gather the skills in leadership, having uh, courses uh, for faculty and residents in leadership. And I hope that the department will continue to emphasize the importance of this. As I look uh, you know, at some of our faculty who have left this place, and Kristen Livingston, congratulations for one, uh, who have gone on to take their leadership skills and uh, use those tools elsewhere. Um, that's something that we should also be proud of. So what's on this list of what really matters? This is my short list. Uh, the first one is derived from Simon Sinek, the famous TED Talk, Understand Why. It's not what you do that people care about. It's why you are doing it. It is what is your mission. And this is, this is sustaining. Ste seek happiness. I, I think that 
um, it's, it's, it's not a simple thing to say, and our own happiness isn't uh, only uh, our own responsibility, but it's partly our own responsibility to seek happiness and help ourselves. And that gets to the third one, believe in, care for yourself. Um, these are important uh, for your future success. Treat people with respect. Communicate with each other. This is fundamental to creating highly effective teams and trust and commitment is respect. Be able to say yes. All of you are extremely talented. You have things to offer. Your time is limited. You can't do everything. But when something comes along where you can make a difference, you've got to be able to say yes. And then you heard about the highly effective teams. So to the next generation of leaders here today, this is something I've said before, um, and I want to say it again, that musculoskeletal care touches the young, the old, the disadvantaged, and the entitled. It's, it's incredible to be involved in this. It's local. It is global. Bones are healed, walking is restored, pain is eliminated. What we are able to do is truly magic. And it's important to pause and recognize that occasionally. Also, you have a responsibility. When you complete your training, you're endowed with a gift and a responsibility, a set of tools that allows you to impact the lives of others and return things that your patients have lost. It's unique in medicine and its best incarnation allows you to amplify that and create positive change in the world. So my wish for all of you is that you will take those tools, the foundation that is here collectively in this room at UCSF in our department and make a difference in the world. And I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to stand in front of you say some of the things that I think it's a, it's a, a real privilege uh, to um, have you listen and to have uh, worked with you for the last 16 years. So thanks again for this. Repairing to the living room? Yeah, sure. I'm going to have you sit there so I can see what I'm going to talk about. All right. Um, welcome. So this is, may seem a little bit redundant, but for those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Pandya, who not surprisingly is on a plane, supposedly coming back from Fiji, who's often missing for a lot of our podcasts, um, myself and Dr. Lansdowne, do a podcast, um, I'd like to say every week, but it tends to be a little bit more um, sporadic than that. And then at the request of Dr. Bale, not us, um, he suggested that we do an interview style for part of this. Um, so for the final UCSF Grand Rounds this year, we are going to um, roast or ask Dr. Bale some questions. I didn't say roast, I didn't <laughs> You said we had some creative latitude. <laughs> So I want to set the stage of what 2007 was like, and it was really, really different. Um, we had an Apple, oh, Apple, what? Well, I'll talk really loud. <laughs> um, so some things were different. Um, the Warriors didn't have Steph Curry yet. We had the We Believe era. Um, Thankfully, the New York Giants were good. The San Francisco Giants, not so good. Barack Obama wasn't president, um, and the Red Sox, for those of you that care, were good, and that was probably about the last time. <laughs> so getting to the first question, Dr. Bale, um, when you stepped in, you touched on this a little bit, um, what was the environment like at UCSF um, and healthcare in general, and how has that changed over the last 16 years? Yeah. Uh, and it's remarkable uh, how much uh, change has occurred and what, what the perspectives are. I, I touched on it a little bit in my comment about Brown and Tolan, um, which some of you may, it was a physician run, you know, organization that negotiated contracts and who was in, who was out, what, what, what did you get paid for what you did? And, uh, you know, 
a lot of anxiety and controversy around that. It was this was in an era when um, you know medical schools and uh, academic centers were just that. They were academic centers. They were essentially practices in places with um, you know a defined group of people doing high quality work, um, publishing, uh, doing research. There wasn't this notion of um, uh, networks, systems uh, that uh, occurs today. Uh, what's what's happened in, in the interim is that the world, uh, you know, and there's probably a few exceptions, but the world sort of changed around academic centers. Um, a lot of it driven by um, cost and healthcare economics, and and the world, meaning larger systems like Sutter, like Kaiser, like Geisinger, you know. Um, in uh, other places around the United States that were uh, beginning to um, aggregate, beginning to um, focus on the delivery of care, uh, that just, just being the world's greatest uh, wasn't good enough if you had to uh, you know, wait three hours, you couldn't find your doctor, there was no place to park. Uh, sounds silly um, when we were um, doing focus groups for uh, uh, patients and before we built the Orthopedic Institute, trying to think about what was what was important, and you know, we listed all these things like the highest quality of care, the best outcome, and somewhere in there was parking. And you you won't be surprised at what um, what they thought was most important. It was parking. Um, so uh, the evolution has been now that health systems realizing, all right, we have to focus more academic health systems have to focus more on the delivery of care, uh, have to focus more on being available to patients in their own community, in their own places, and, and how do we accomplish that through um, you know, growth, through partnership. Thus, you see UCSF affiliated with uh, Marin Health, with Muir, with Washington Hospital, with Skippa in the South Bay, um, and this, is, this has been uh, a fundamental change. I'll, I'll say that it's not fully baked, uh, you know, what those relationships are. We have relationships. How do we interact? How is it um, you know, successfully carried out? What is the added value? Um, not clear entirely. I mean, I think that represents an opportunity again for, you know, those of you who are interested in, in these kinds of things and working with the health system. Um, because it, it, it needs to uh, evolve to really um, define um, the value that it brings to the health system. Uh, it's, not, it's not done. So uh, I wouldn't take it at face value, these relationships that UCSF has now, that they won't change. I expect that they will. Yeah, you bring up parking. Um, can you validate for today? Because I pay for <laughs> parking today. It's your ticket you've got to worry about. Then. Um, so when you started as chair, can you pick out what you thought was going to be the single biggest challenge? Um, yes, uh, and in a nutshell, and this is encompasses a lot of things, it was um, financial viability. Um, quite frankly, this department was in tough shape. Um, we were, uh, it, this was an era where um, we had to go to the health system every year and negotiate uh, called strategic support. Um, what was the health system going to give us if, in exchange for us doing our jobs, okay? <laughs> Bad situation to be in. Uh, that's, uh, but, but we didn't, you know, our expenses as a department exceeded our revenue. <clears throat> Economics 101, everybody understands that doesn't work and so we had to find other, other sources of, uh, revenue to support um, our, our entire mission. And um, so it was through strategic support. And um, you know, with the uh, concept of this orthopedic institute, and I would have called it musculoskeletal institute, but nobody knew at that point what I was talking about. The idea being that this place would be where anyone involved in musculoskeletal care could deliver care and this academic hierarchy would be in the background, but it would make sense to patients. Um, 
we had to build it. It, it had to um, start up. It had to hit certain targets to be um, financially viable. Um, and we knew, and Richard probably remembers those graphs going like this, you know, financially before they went up. And um, uh, we knew that that would be a challenge, but we believed in the idea. And as I mentioned, this is a joint venture between the hospital, the health system, let me be clear, it's the health system, not the school, the health system and the department. And it has supported our academic mission. And uh, so that was job one. And, and, and often it is, this is not a, um, you know, the highest uh, calling to, you know, financial viability, but you, you have to have that to sustain the things that are, you know, more important to our core mission. But that was the biggest challenge at the beginning. Looking back, was that your biggest challenge all the way through, was maintaining financial stewardship, uh, viability, or did that change over time? I would say it remains fundamentally important, but we are also in a much better position um, uh, from a financial standpoint where we're not thinking day to day about how's this going to work. Um, we can occupy our thoughts more with where are our priorities. Um, now, I'll say, uh, and uh, you know, those of you who've been on the executive committee know that our expenses continue to rise quickly. And uh, so it's a big challenge ahead of us to support our academic mission, our education, uh, our educational programs, the cost of those you know, far exceed what we get from the school and the system or the federal government to support them. Same thing with research. But these are our are, are core activities. So if we make a penny, we're going to spend it on those things. Um, that's what we, we, we make money for, to do those things. Um, so I wouldn't ever take it for granted, uh, but I would say we're in a much better position. Now, um, let's be honest, there are headwinds. Uh, you know, healthcare economics continues to be challenging. Uh, we have to continue to be creative. Uh, think about uh, what sorts of things can we do to support our academic mission and funnel the clinical dollars to the uh, clinicians. Um, so it's, it's there, but we are lucky here in this department because we have the, the opportunity because of our circumstances to think about the mission and not focus just on the dollars and cents. So you make being chair sound really, really hard. What made you decide that you wanted to be a chair and what sort of leadership or previous things that you had done while at Duke or even and when you were, and Drew didn't mention this, in the Hall of Fame of your high school, <laughs> um, um, what made you decide that you thought you would want to do this type of job? Yeah. Um, maybe naivete. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess that's honestly, it's, it's, it's part of it. But, uh, you know, thinking that there is a better way perhaps to organize ourselves to do things. Believing, as I was saying in my slides, in the importance of uh, musculoskeletal care, the impact of that. And I'm a real believer in, in service lines, you know, really, and, and I don't mean just the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, I mean that whole service of musculoskeletal care and understanding it from the uh, onset of symptoms, the outpatient care to the inpatient care, the, the whole continuum and um, taking responsibility for that and managing that and believing that there's opportunity when um, the system is managed that way and you understand it fully. It's just, it's like anything else, the better you understand it, uh, the easier it becomes to manage. And, um, and again, naivete is probably um, accurate, yeah, you, you, you know, the, when you don't know everything, you oversimplify. Um, it gives you courage. Um, but that's, that's fundamentally why I wanted to do it, because I saw an opportunity to do something differently. And, um, and there were you know, uh, other examples out there that led me to believe that it would work. I would point to uh, what Richard Gelberman was doing at Wash U, got my attention. You know, he was one of the first to uh, have a, an ambulatory center that was a joint venture. And I spent a lot of time with Richard talking about that, how it worked, um, what, 
what the difficulties were, um, how he got the health system to go along with it. And it has to be a win-win. Uh, that's another point that's, that's worth making. You've got to uh, believe when you have an idea and if you, you've got a partner that you want to bring along the journey with you, which is the health system, that it works for them. And it has. I mean, it's really, it's been a good thing for the health system. Um, and so if you've got something like that that, uh, that works, works for everybody involved, you have a good chance of being successful. Um, so I want to go back seven, I guess at this point, probably 17, 18 years. You mentioned it was a big transition to go from Duke, North Carolina, maybe a little bit more of a red state to come all the way out here. And one of the things that's always been impressive is seeing your dedication to your family, whether that's to Lisa, the real Dr. Vale, right. um, or your kids and now your grandkids. What was it like to make that transition and to have that conversation like, not only am I gonna take on more responsibility, but I'm gonna do it in San Francisco across the country? Yeah, well, um, this will maybe be helpful to, or not to anyone who's considering a move. And I should, Lisa should help me answer this question, but it is, our kids were in high school at that point. Um, it was difficult. Um, Fundamentally, I felt uh, it was a great opportunity for the family as well. We're in leafy green suburbia, a small town. Kids are um, children of two doctors. Life's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, and I thought, okay, come to San Francisco. You're going to be in a more diverse environment. You're going to have to learn how to take the bus. Uh, believe it or not, if you haven't noticed, doctors are not at the top of the food chain in this city. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, I thought it was good for the family, but um, my kids didn't think so. Uh, and uh, my daughter was a senior. She, she acquiesced to coming out here, and she did a semester in high school. And for her, it was like a semester abroad, and she negotiated going back to um, uh, her high school in North Carolina, lived with a friend and graduated. My son, who came as a sophomore, said, buddy, uh, you know, you're here, you're not going anywhere, dig in. And uh, <laughs> it's not easy to make friends at that point. And, um, and literally, we had counseling together to get through this. At one point, the counselor said to Lisa and I, gosh, I really feel badly for Parker. And we're like, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 Thanks a lot, you know, that's... That's not what we wanted to hear. And, and finally, Parker said to us, look, I don't, I don't need therapy. I'm fine. And uh, so we went through those challenges. And you know, fast forward many years later, we're blessed to have our kids living in the Bay Area, made a lot of friends through their experiences here. And um, so it worked out. But the, the, the transition is often not easy. Uh, I think, again, what allowed us to do this and believe it was um, the, the fundamentals of why we were doing it and what, what it would offer to you know, everyone involved in the family. Yeah, so speaking of transition, um, you know, orthopedic surgery is not the most progressive group. Um, we're probably a little bit backwards. We're certainly a little bit behind the times in research, and we've certainly been behind the times for a lot of other professions and healthcare professions in terms of diversity. But over the last 10 to 15 years, but probably realistically the last five years, there's been a big switch in the awareness of the importance of diversity. Um, do you think being in San Francisco or being in a place that is a little bit more supportive of diversity has made your job and really being a champion across the country for um, outreach and diversity a little bit easier? Or do you think it's just been part of the transition for orthopedic surgery in general? I think it's uneven. Uh, as I, you know, again, being uh, where, where I said I've had the opportunity to go to a number of other places over the years and see what's going on, I, I would say generally there's a, a movement in the right direction in this regard, you know, a, a recognition of of inclusion, of, of listening to people, about providing opportunities. So I would say overall positive, but it's just, it's a little uh, uneven. We're, we're, and I'm, what I mean is that, you know, uh, the, the, the sense you get, the conversation, uh, is, it, uh, is it really happening? Is there, is there change or is it a, a little bit of lip service? You know, Talmadge King um, 
our dean likes to say that the, the tension that comes with DEI discussions is healthy. It means that you're getting to something. If you feel some tension, if you're a little uncomfortable, then you're, you're hitting the nerve. You're really discussing the issue. And I, I feel like uh, when I say uneven, that, that, uh, that the tension is a little different from place to place. Uh, you know, if you think you've got the issue solved, then you're probably not there yet. Um, if, you, if you feel a lot of tension and you're have, making tangible project, progress, then maybe you're doing a better job. So overall, I'm, I'm, I'm positive on um, the, the changes that are happening. Um, you can argue about pace, and I think the pace is uneven. Um, and there's a lot more to do, and there are a lot of people in this room who know far more about this than I do, but those are, those are my... That's my sense of what's going on in our, our, our field, our specialty. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that, not in a bad way, but what do you think the key is then to retaining and recruiting a diverse faculty, whether in a place like San Francisco or across the country? How do you make that diversity grow? Um, well, one of the key things, and I guess there are a number, it's not, not a simple answer, but one of the key things is something that's um, been a focus here is the pipeline. You know, uh, making uh, people aware of what the opportunities are, uh, what life is like as an orthopedic surgeon, um, and, and that, that you can do this, um, and uh, that anybody can, can do this. So we have a hard enough time exposing uh, surgical subspecialties to medical students, period. And now when we're trying to um, you know, make it uh, available, make it uh, make uh, subpopulations of the school aware of this, it's an even harder challenge and you have to work at it and, and invite people in. Um, we're, we're lucky because we have some role models here now. This has grown where uh, you can say, yeah, there is somebody who's just like you that's doing this. It's not a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a myth. It, it's, it's, it's real, and I think that helps. So there, there are a lot of things, and those are some of them. So I want to ask you a question about your leadership style. If you could pick <clears throat> one word to describe your leadership style, what would it be? Um, Well, I guess uh, principled would be the word that no. I would say to you. <laughs> um, and, and I would also say that uh, I, you know, I'm aware of all these dis different descriptions of leaders that are, you know, fall into different categories. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think you can be a one-dimensional leader. You know, you, you, you can't be the just a servant leader. You can't be, you know, somebody who's, um, you know, the, the dominant lead by example. You, you need a little bit of all of that. But, um, you know, principled is, the, the reason I come up with that one is it sort of, uh, maybe we're reflected in the comments that I made earlier. Um, there's an underlying reason for what you're doing and you fill in the details around that. And sometimes it requires a different approach um, on a different day, in a different setting. And you have to have that toolbox of skills. And uh, so a, a leader can't just be one thing to uh, accomplish a whole slate, deal with a different type of challenge. Uh, so. But if you're, if you're fundamentally driven by um, principles that people can align with, then they may accept disagreeing with you. And there will be disagreements. There are disagreements. Uh, you, you don't always see eye to eye with everybody on things. And so you've got to be able to work past that because you've got a fundamental principle that's driving where you're headed. And that, that doesn't mean, uh, when I say disagreements, that 
that I'm always right or I'm the most knowledgeable. As the chair, you're not. And I think you have to kind of uh, realize that, be able to change your mind, uh, and then sometimes be able to say, look, thanks for that input, we're, we're gonna do this. Yeah, I had a follow-up question, but I think that's a perfect word, so I got nothing. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Lansdowne, who's got some rapid-fire questions, um, just to make sure we can keep you on your toes. Uh-oh. They should be even easier questions. Um, so maybe on that direction of leadership, what is the best leadership advice you've ever received? Well, as I guess um, probably I would say um, don't assume that you're the expert on everything or that you have to be. Um, it's a team effort. You're leading the team, but um, being uh, the leader doesn't necessarily mean that you are the right answer every time. And then um, <clears throat> what is the worst advice that someone tried to give you? <laughs> Ah, oh, gosh. I, I think uh, the worst advice. I guess it, it, I don't know that it's advice. That I can't think of, per se, somebody saying this to me. But this question comes up a lot. And it's the notion that, um, gosh, if I just had that title, if I were just the chair, things would be great. It would solve the problems. I would be in total control. <laughs> Just not true. There are bad chair jobs. Um, you're not in total control, thank you all very much. Um, it's, you, you have to deal with a lot of uh, variability. So um, if, if you believe uh, those things, that you're the smartest person in the room all the time and you're in total control, you're going to be a delusional leader. And that's not the category of leadership that I think Brian was asking about. <laughs> Um, so switching a little bit, so you obviously achieved at every level you know, uh, that I could find, high school, college, medical school. Uh, what would you have done um, if you did not go into medicine? I would have been a fireman. Um, <laughs> that's, what, that's what Charlie's going to be. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I, what, what I really uh, love... Um, I've, I've loved taking care of patients, so that's part. So if I didn't go into medicine, what, what would be second? I'm, I'm still fascinated by technology, technology that you know, is a platform that can change things. And you know, these are where my conflicts lie. Those are the things that I continue to want to pursue is tech, technology that can be paradigm changing. And so as, and, and uh, as my background, I'm an engineer, so it probably would have been something in that, maybe in the life sciences. Uh, I wasn't um, smart enough to realize, you know, that computer science would have been a good thing to study back then. Um, that, and biomedical engineering didn't exist when I went to engineering school. Uh, so uh, you kind of had to piece that together, but probably that. Um, I, and that's what's sort of attracted my attention to um, being a, a collaborator um, with many really talented scientists is that, that notion that the technology could fundamentally change things. So I would want to pursue that. I love that. And then uh, within orthopedics, if you had not become a um, hip and knee arthroplasty surgeon, were you ever exploring other directions or did you see yourself in other areas of orthopedic surgery? In orthopedics? Right. Alone? Yeah. Um, you, you, you know you're going to say sports. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, at, at, the, at the initiation of my career, I was thinking, could I be a knee surgeon from cradle to grave? And this is, this is not an uncommon thought that many residents have. Because um, they just, you know, maybe love a particular joint. And, and, and in some practice settings, you can do that. Um, it's when you're in, uh, you know, an, an academic setting and, you know, subspecialty, uh, first of all, you, you start to get really busy and you realize, eh, that's not practical. I can't do scopes and ACL reconstructions and uh, also do total joints and revisions and hips and knees. And you need to focus a little bit. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, Brian, I think sports, sports medicine is like the front door. If you don't, everybody likes sports to some degree, right? <laughs> exactly. That's just what uh, got people attracted to the field. But uh, again, probably going back to my device orientation, that's kind of how I migrated into arthroplasty. I was just uh, uh, intrigued by what that had to offer. Uh, and then within arthroplasty, you have done a lot of knee replacements, a lot of hip replacements, left side, right side, revision of each. Um, what is your favorite surgical procedure? Yeah, I have uh, flip-flopped on this one back and forth. You know, as I said, I thought, okay, initially I'd be a knee surgeon only. And I was gonna be John Insall's fellow. Uh, and some of you may remember that name, John Insall's like one of the, the father of uh, knee surgery. Well, at the time, right when I was gonna go be his fellow, he decided to leave special surgery and go, uh, you know, establish a private practice and, you know, ask if I uh, would want to go along as a fellow. And I, I envisioned myself, you know, helping them set up chairs in the waiting room. And, uh, and I just thought, you yeah, I think, uh, uh, so again, another, you got to sort of reinvent yourself. Um, but then over the years, yeah, I really like this innovation in knee surgery. I like this change in hip surgery, you know, Knee surgery is very easy. Hips dislocate. Well, now hip surgery has gotten better. Uh, so I've, I've flip-flopped on that. And consequently, I've been um, pleased to have both of those things in, in my uh, repertoire. And uh, as, as simple as it sounds, every case is a little bit different. The arthroplasty surgeons can back me up on this. It's not just four, <laughs> not just four types of surgery. You sports guys, um, but that's that's what's kept me uh, interested is having a little bit of diversity in practice too uh, over time, so you can continue to evolve even if you're a subspecialist. Um, and then, you know, you're involved on many novel technologies. Um, if you had to pick one problem that you see as, you know, like the next big breakthrough in orthopedic surgery, what do you think that will look like? Yeah, uh, you know, it's broadly, it's regenerative strategies, uh, you know, and this is this has kind of been the holy grail uh, from the beginning of my career, but um, I think we're getting closer and closer to, you know, having, you know, technology and understanding, whether we're talking muscle, cartilage, or bone, um, that I suspect um, will make a difference in practice uh, in the, the, the course of the, uh, time that the trainees that we're training now are in practice. Uh, you know, I made the comment that everything that we do, we could do better. If you just, if you just think about it, even in my own subspecialty, we're treating arthritis with a big operation. We're cutting off the femoral head. We're replacing it with big hunks of metal and plastic. It works, okay? It's great. It's been, uh, you know, deemed as, you know, one of the operations of the century, hip replacement in particular. But is that really the best we can do? You know, can't we somehow replace the cartilage? Uh, isn't, isn't there a way to do this without being so invasive? I think the answer is yes. I continue to believe that even though it's an example of a highly successful operation. So uh, that's what's interesting. That's what we strive for, even if it's a subset of our population that are getting you know, joint replacement. Can, can we be more uh, joint sparing? Can we be uh, more focused on regeneration than replacement? All right, maybe last question in this section. Um, so fast forward two months. It's a nice day. It's Tuesday. There's no waiting on the spinal at Zion, uh, seeing if the patient's rolling back yet. Um, where do you see yourself and what are you going to be doing? Yeah. Um, well, I may have a, uh, a Zoom call with one of my scientific advisory boards. Uh, I may be uh, helping um, the JBJS finalize the decision about the new editor-in-chief, which is kind of on our plate now. Uh, and then I'll be um, thinking about uh, how to keep my elbow in and uh, get the drive straight down the middle of the fairway. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So all of that in one day would be great. <laughs> Um, so I think we have time for a couple questions. So I wanted to open it up 
Um, maybe to Lisa Vale, if you had a question on, could he be doing something better <laughs> on a Tuesday afternoon in two months? Um, I do actually, actually, over seven years, I've been Seventeen years ago, you asked me a question. You said, did, you, uh, did, I ever, did you ever think I'd bring you back home? And you did. Um, but you had a vision of excellence, an excellent center, phenomenal patient care, developing you know, the country's next leaders and orthopedic surgeons. But you did it with grace and humility. Um, but again, you did it really, really well. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. So where, where are we going to go first? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I'll have to say to Lisa's credit, when this whole San Francisco thing came up, Lisa's from San Francisco, so those of you, some of you may know that. Uh, and I, I was offered the job and I said no. And I expected her to say, what are you thinking? Uh, but she didn't. She said, okay, well, why? And we talked about it. And, and, the, and, the, and the dean actually said the same thing. Okay, why? And we talked about it. And... Uh, you know, the rest is history, but thank you for uh, giving me that latitude and being understanding of the decision process. Appreciate that. All right, speaking of other leaders, does anybody else have questions for Dr. Vale? This is probably your last time to actually ask him that question. I'll take questions informally anytime, so. So uh, today, many of you know, is the first day of residency for all of these guys, our new interns. Welcome. Um, and I'm sure you've already talked with them, Dr. Fail, but uh, in front of the, the whole crowd, what advice do you have for these guys who are just starting this journey? Um, anything specific to the very beginning of, of residency? Some advice? Yeah, for sure. Hopefully, uh, you know, through, and welcome, you guys. Great to see your faces after meeting you on Zoom. Uh, and um, hopefully, looking, having a chance in your first day to kind of see an overview, uh, which is sort of a unique thing. We don't do that uh, very often. Uh, helps to establish, uh, you know, probably what you knew already, the excitement of the field, the possibilities, where it's headed, what, what you can do. But my advice is, uh, just to remind you, you can't do that all at once. It's, uh, there's gonna be stops and starts. You're gonna feel overwhelmed. Um, and gradually, through training, it begins to fall into place. And, um, and then there'll be a new concern. And that's healthy. Um, that's how you, how you evolve and grow in your career. But um, be, be engaged, learn as much as you can. Uh, be patient with yourself, because uh, there's, there's a lot uh, in front of you each day when you're just getting started in, in your training. And uh, you know, talk to the fifth years so you get a little near-term expectation of uh, what your, how your life is gonna change over the next few years. And congratulations. All right, well, on behalf of the rest of the department and whoever else is listening on Zoom, I know Dr. Bozik wanted a personal shout out, so he gets his personal shout out. Um, a sincere thank you for all your dedication, work, service. Um, I think just presence here has made a difference in so many people's lives, your patients, your colleagues, uh, the residents, fellows, and everybody, so thank you. Thank you for doing this.